All right, welcome everybody, and uh, glad to be back. Uh, I heard last week's lecture with uh, Ryan Gray was well handled by Barbara and Sarah, so I'm very thankful for that, that you guys uh, were able to come out and do it. Um, let a couple more people in. Just as a reminder, this is our last one. I know it has been confusing. I have emailed every single speaker this week. I'm sorry, Raphael, I did it to you reminding them that the lecture was on Tuesday and uh, they've been on Wednesday all week and for the Tuesday carnival class. And it's just, uh, it's just when it gets in your brain, it's on a Tuesday every single, you do like 40 times in a row. And then it just all of a sudden it's not on Tuesdays. It's confusing, I get it. So I'm sorry about that, but we are moving along into March and April. We are completely filled up for six lectures over the next two months. Uh, in March, um, Dr. Michael Bashamp, our next one, Dr. Michael Bashamp, is going to be talking about the instruments of empire, empire colonial elites and U.S. governance in early national Louisiana. Uh, March 15th, Dr. Alicia Long is be doing her long-awaited book about the Kennedy assassination and Clay Shaw. And then um, Dr. Stephan will be doing, Mar on March 22nd, Walt Whitman's New Orleans Sidewalk Sketches and Newspaper Rambles. So we've also got Liz Williams in April, um, and then we, we've got a bunch of other speakers as well. So if this is your first time, I hope that uh, you get to think this is worth the $10 you paid, but you could also become a member for $40 and you can get all of these lectures. So um, we're gonna be doing these. Are they these Tuesday or Wednesday? They'll all be Tuesday. They all that we're going back to normal. Okay, <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, we'll be going back to all Tuesdays, and um, and and we'll be back to our normal schedule. Um, that was just to accommodate the carnival class, which is uh, got one more class next week. So if you haven't taken that, that's also available. Still, we record that as well. So um, our speaker this week is a PhD student at University of California, Santa Cruz. He is a New Orleans native, and he's back here finishing up his research on his dissertation. And uh, we're excited to have him. His lecture tonight is entitled New Orleans and Latin America in the Mid-19th Century, A Historic Symbiosis. Please welcome Raphael Dalgidio. Hello, everyone. Uh, and before I get started, can everybody see my slide? Yes. OK, good. All right. So it's shared. All right. So. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining me. Let's hop right into it. Um, just want to uh, uh, explain that my view as a researcher is that New Orleans should be studied not only as a city in the United States, but as a site that is a product of and indeed emblematic of the Americas as a historical process, as, uh, as a historical process and the historical process of colonialism in particular, including ideas of modernity, race, and borderlands, right? Um, with that being said, I just want to read the um, the little uh, description that I wrote for this um, for this uh, for this lecture that made it on Facebook because I want to reemphasize something. So during the mid 19th century, when New Orleans emerged as one of the central ports in the United States, the city was also busy maintaining commercial and cultural connections to much of Latin America through trade, travel, and migration. By considering the tense relations amongst the city's newspaper men, its community of Cuban revolutionaries, and its wealthy Spanish merchant class along with the precarious presence of Mexican political exiles, this lecture will, re will reveal how New Orleans played a significant role in the emergence of the Americas as a geopol geopolitical entity of independent republics in the decades before and after the Civil War. So I do wanna emphasize that, that as New Orleans is emerging as a major port in the United States, uh, many of the places that it's trading with, that some of its major trading partners are themselves emerging as independent republics. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, uh, one of the ways that we see this is through the migration patterns. Here we have um, a table uh, of the 1850 census um, that was compiled. This table was compiled by J.D. B. DeBow, who was uh, one of the um, most influential newspaper publishers um, from the 1850s in New Orleans. He, uh, he was a, a proponent of Manifest Destiny, so let's keep that in mind. Uh, if we see here, if we look at this table, we see that Louisiana has more migrants from Spain and the West Indies than any other state listed, including New York and Florida. So people from Spain and the West Indies, and, and if you look at the wording, um, they say Latino population, um, you know, I, I wouldn't use Latino for, for Spain or, or Portugal. I, you know, those are Latin European countries. 
Uh, Latino is a term we really use for people of Latin American descent that live in the United States. So when we look at the West Indies, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that um, this table is talking about Cubans, Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans. And again, we can see that there's more of them in Louisiana than they are in New York and Florida. That's not the case today, I can assure you. Uh, um, so these groups are held in considerable, they're here in considerable numbers, they're in, the, in New Orleans in considerable numbers. And as we'll see, the history of the of Spanish language newspaper sort of animates uh, this history pretty vibrantly. Um, and we're gonna study, uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna dive in to a historical event uh, that, that shows us not only how uh, New Orleans was affected by its, the geopolitics of its region, but also how it, it shaped these politics itself. It was a player in that politics. And for that, we have to go back to uh, studying an event that became known as the Lopez Riot, which, became, which took place on August 21st, 1851. Uh, it was an event that saw American filibusters uh, and, supporter, and their supporters, along with some Cuban refugees, attack Spanish-owned businesses, including Spain's consulate, right? Um, when we look at these maps here, I'm gonna be referring to these two maps throughout the rest of the presentation. The first one is one that I made on Google Earth. Unfortunately, I hadn't figured out how to use Google Earth on, on PowerPoint, which probably would've made this a lot more interactive and fun. But um, just know that the numbers are not in a particular order. They're there just as a reference point. They're, uh, most of them I'm gonna to refer to. There's some that I won't, that aren't gonna be relevant to, um, to today's lecture. But uh, I do want to show how the Lopez riot basically took place in this area. And when we look at the, uh, at the, um, at the map on the right that was made by, I believe, by Richard Campanella uh, in a newspaper article you know, that he wrote about, about New Orleans newspapers in the 19th century, uh, he made a map showing where the concentration of newspaper offices were in the 1890s. The thing is, you can, you can use the same um, map to understand the, con the concentration of newspaper uh, offices in the 1850s as well. It's not that much different. And so it's a reference. We see that much like today, uh, back then, the French Quarter and the CBD were places that were really, really important to, um, to the city's commerce, particularly back then uh, when, when the port was done by manual labor. Um, again, remember that these, the concentration of these newspapers is important. Their location is important because these men were spearheading Manifest Destiny and U.S. expansionism. Um, these, these newspapers instigated uh, the Mexican-American War, which was only, which happened very recently in the 1850s. The Mexican-American War, I believe, ended in 1849. And now these same people were aiming their, uh, their desires and their resources towards Cuba. So let's start at 8 a.m. on August 21st, 1851. A steamship called the Empire City arrives in New Orleans from Havana. And here we, I've uh, uh, got a map of the, the, the steamship routes that were taken. Um, back then, uh, uh, if you were traveling between New Orleans and Havana by steamship, you would have taken this route that would have stopped along the Gulf Coast. It would have taken about four days, which four days is a long time, but in 1850s, we're talking about lightning speed. And um, to the right, we've got images of one is a black and white photograph of the Empire City. Uh, and the other one is a, is a drawing made by hand of the same ship. And uh, we see towards the, the right lower hand corner is, um, is a depiction of, of what that port would have looked like around that same time in the heyday of these, the heyday of these uh, steamships. Now, what we have to understand is that on August 21st at 8 a.m., uh, there was a gentleman named Mr. Brincio, who was the deputy consul of Spain in New Orleans. He arrived in the city with mail from at least two dozen American prisoners who had been captured during a filibustering expedition led by General Narciso Lopez and their goal was to overthrow the Spanish colonial government in Cuba. Uh, they had been captured and many had already been executed. Uh, Lopez would be captured soon um, and he'd be executed on September 1st. But for now we're in August 21st. So let's, before we dive in, into the riot on, of August 21st, 1851, let's talk a little bit about the filibustering expedition and what led to it. So um, a filibuster in the context of foreign relations is someone who engages in at least, or at least in, at least nominally, an unauthorized military expedition into a foreign country or territory to form it or support a political revolution or secession. The term usually applied to, uh, is usually applied to citizens of the United States, but honestly, a lot of um, Cubans took on the term of filibustero in Spanish. Um, and depending on, on, on which group of filibusters you were talking to, there were, particularly when it came to Cuba, there were some people that were, uh, filibusters who wanted Cuba to be an independent country, 
But then there were uh, others like Narciso Lopez who were interested in allowing the United States to annex Cuba once it had been liberated from Spain. Um, Lopez seems to have at first favored independence, but then um, he transferred into being um, into being more of an annexationist. Uh, this is a, a lithograph a drawing of Narciso Lopez that was um, uh, engraved expressly for the Delta, the Daily Delta uh, newspaper, which was one of the boosters for the um, for the expedition. The one in 1851 had actually been his third. He had one in 1848, one in 1849, and then again in 1851. They all failed. In 1851, he was actually captured and killed. Um, the image that we have on the right with uh, these men in the red coats has been provided to me by the Historic New Orleans Collection. And, um, and it's a depiction of, of, uh, of Lopez and his filibusters landing in Cuba in one of their failed uh, filibustering expeditions. Now, I mentioned that the filibustering uh, expeditions that he took were in 1848, 1849, 1851. So what did he do in 1850? What, 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 why didn't he uh, 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 launch an expedition? Well, one of the things that we know he was doing is that he was creating support or trying to build support throughout the Cuban diaspora. The two main locations of the Cuban diaspora in the 1850s were in New York and in New Orleans. And um, uh, real quickly, um, one, of the, one of the results of, of, of building this uh, the support is that the Cuban flag was designed and and sewn up for the first time by Narciso Lopez's um, the supporters. And in the spring of 1850, on on a uh, on the same day, there were two simultaneous events: one in New York and one in New Orleans, where the Cuban flag was unveiled in public in both cities. Right in New Orleans, that event has been commem commemorated by a plaque that sits on on the 500 block of Poydras which is today uh, the Hale Boggs Federal Building, that would be on our map, that would be number two, number one. So if you go to number one, you'll see this plaque on the left hand, on the left hand corner. You can go there today. We'll go there tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon if you've never seen this plaque and you'll see it on a big concrete slab. You'll see this, this plaque that says the Cuban flag was first flown in 1850 from the site, uh, from the home of the Daily Delta. And uh, as we established with the engraving, the Daily Delta was one of Narciso Lopez's biggest um, supporters. And here's um, a snippet from one of their stories uh, in August of 1850, where they uh, where they actually explain um, uh, where they actually unveil the Cuban flag uh, for the first time. Uh, they actually ran a story where they talked about how they draped a giant version of the flag in front of their office on Poitras Street. Right, so. Um, we see that it's a, you know, there's a lot of support for this um, amongst the American newspapers. Uh, all right. One thing that we have to remember is that not all Cubans in New Orleans were militants. Uh, by the 1850s, New Orleans had become home to a community of Cuban political exiles and refugees. Uh, lectures, essays, and pamphlets were given, written, and published in New Orleans on the topic of Cuban liberation from Spain and it's in the island's independence. And amongst um, the, this, this class of writers and, and, and people who promoted the independence of Spain were men that, that were here in New Orleans in the 1850s were men such as Leopoldo Turla, Pedro Santa Cilia, Domingo Goicuria, y, uh, and Jose Agustin Cisneros. Uh, Leopoldo Turla or Cisneros, one of the two, I can't remember which one, one of them was buried in St. Boniface uh, Cemetery um, uh, in, in, in the city. Um, Pedro Santa Cilia uh, was is is uh, worthy of knowing. He's actually going to become relevant later, a little bit later in the in the uh, this presentation. But I just want to uh, 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 say some things about him. He was born in Santiago de Cuba in 1826. He was exiled to the United States in the early 1850s for supporting ind Cuban independence. Uh, you know, very vociferously. Uh, he was he was deported to Spain, but then left Spain because it was really rough for him there, and he managed to get to the United States. While in New Orleans, he wrote poetry and pamphlets that advocated for Cuba's freedom. He worked as, a, as the editor of a pro-Cuban newspaper in New York. Uh, and he gave lectures in both New Orleans and New York, where, uh, as I said, the largest Cuban um, diaspora communities uh, in the United States lived. But let's get back to the day of the Lopez riot, August 21st. And we know that uh, uh, Deputy Counsel Brincio has, um, has brought mail to the, um, has mail that, that, that uh, is to be delivered uh, uh, to the city. And 
instead of going to the post office, which is on Canal Street at the time, uh, the post office would, would have been in the Merchants Exchange building, which um, is number six on our map here on Canal Street. Uh, if you're having a, a, a rough time visualizing where that is, it's a block away from the Popeyes on Canal Street. So a block up, right? And um, he would have gone to deposit, uh, you know, he was supposed to deposit this mail uh, at the post office. But instead of doing that, he doesn't, he doesn't go there uh, directly. Uh, he either, he either went to the offices of a Spanish language newspaper or he went to the consulate. We don't know, it's not well documented as far as I can tell, um, but I don't believe that he went uh, to, to, the, uh, to the post office. Um, the actual Spanish consul was a man named Juan Ignacio Laborde, and he lived at the Chica's mansion on Dauphine Street, which is number 11 on the map. And his, uh, he lived there with his business partner who was named Angel Chica's, who's, who's, uh, that's who the house is named after. Uh, Angel Chicas is also a Spaniard, uh, and Chicas and Laborde were uh, both merchants who ran their businesses out of, the, out of this house, and they lived in it too. Uh, we know by the late morning uh, that there was tension in the air around the city about this, and that placards had been posted threatening to attack the offices of, of the newspaper, uh, La Union, which was run by Spaniards, or even the consul itself. Uh, Later reports would say that the first tensions in the city erupted in the in a cigar shop owned by a, a Spaniard located at the corner of St. Charles and Gravier. Uh, the store's clerk, this is number seven on the map. The store's clerk, uh, a man named Gonzalez, uh, got into an argument with some supporters of Lopez from what we can tell. So, so sometime in, um, so sometime in the late morning, the editors of La Unión, um, two Spanish who were named Victor Aleman and E. Juan Gonzalez, uh, began working on a special edition of the paper that, would, that they would publish later that afternoon that would be about um, the failed expedition and how um, uh, uh, some of the Americans that were involved in the expedition had been executed. Um, the publication's immediate... Now, one thing that we have to understand about, about La Unión is that uh, its editors had been publishing a, a Spanish language newspaper in New Orleans since at least 1846, maybe 1845. Um, it had an immediate, the, the La Union had an immediate predecessor named La Patria, which they had to change, they had to end that and restart a newspaper because they lost funding and they had to find, they had to um, secure new funding and that led to a new, new newspaper. But it's known that in, while the um, Anglophone, you know, the English language newspapers were stoking expansionism and war against Mexico, uh, Gomez and Aleman were fiercely against uh, US expansionism and would publish these papers. So they were a voice, a Spanish language voice of dissent in the city, unlike no other. Um, they also had uh, some of the things that were really um, unique about La Patria and La Union is that uh, it was a source of news for American editors, not just Spanish speakers in the city. Uh, they had correspondence in Mexico and other parts of language uh, in other parts of, of Latin America, and they would often translate Spanish language newspapers for uh, for uh, an English speaking audience. So it served a purpose. Um, if we see here uh, in this uh, in this image, uh, we've got an image of a printing press, uh, a small. This is what a small printing press would have looked like at the time in the 1850s. La Union printed about two or three times a, a week, so they probably would have had a bigger printing press than this. Um, they were located in, um, in Exchange Alley, number five, which is number five on this map. That block today is occupied by the State Supreme Court building, but back then it would have been an alley. Approximately, um, this painting is of that same uh, block of that alley. Uh, and you can tell because it's right before the St. Louis Hotel. Um, you can see the St. Louis Hotel in the background, a block uh, beyond where today um, we know that, uh, that that block is occupied by the Supreme Court building and the uh, modern um, Omni Royal Orleans occupies the space where the St. Louis once stood. Um, so at 2 p.m., uh, Mayor uh, Abdel Crossman is made aware of plans to attack La Union, and he calls upon the Spanish consul, who was uh, located at a, the Spanish consulate was located uh, at uh, number four the corner of Bourbon and, uh, and St. Louis. I don't know which building, but I've narrowed it down to likely it being Razoo's or the Chris Owens Club, but I'm not sure. The mayor's offices were at the Cabildo. They wouldn't, um, 
the mayor's office and the rest of city government wouldn't move into Gallier Hall until 1852 or 1853. Um, but once uh, Mayor Crossman was made aware of the plans to attack uh, Spaniards, he summoned the consul in hopes to get him to persuade the, the, the La Union not to publish anything uh, in fears that he would just stoke, that they would just stoke more uh, tension in the city. Uh oh, hold on. It's going a little too fast. Sorry. Uh, so by 2.30 p.m., the La Union is handing out um, the extra issues of that it printed at, uh, of, uh, of, El, of La Union. Um, and as expected, it was pretty aggressive. And uh, it came out against um, the, uh, the, the filibusters. And um, it was seen as something offensive because a lot of these uh, filibusters had already been executed. And so uh, this is when it really starts to, to, to heat up. Um, it's when, uh, okay. Okay, so the, the um, so we know that uh, the newspaper was printed at three o'clock at 2.30, but tensions had been building all day. In fact, tensions had actually been building for weeks, but, but because of um, the news of the mail coming in and it hadn't been not being delivered to the post office, the tensions ran really, really high. So when the issue was already printed, it circulated pretty fast throughout the city. And between three and four o'clock, a crowd finally attacked the offices of La Union. They ran the editors out of the building in Exchange Alley. Um, and the editors were never seen in the city again. Uh, the crowd, which, you know, it's the, 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 the newspaper reports have a hard time trying to you know, say who, how many people were in the crowd, but I, I figured that it was a lot. It may have even been as many as a couple of hundred because of the fact that they were going in all over the city in, a, in such a short amount of time. But they went into these offices and they took apart its, uh, the offices of this newspaper, they took apart its um, printing press, which um, was considerably large. We're talking about something that probably weighed a couple thousand pounds and they destroyed it and threw it out into the street. Uh, they completely ransacked the, um, the offices and, um, and they were never seen ever again. Um, these images, again, they're of printing presses and of the, the actual block where the, um, where the newspaper would have been located. To, at the bottom right is a contemporary picture of Exchange Alley, just to give you an idea of, of what that uh, location looks like. I thought it was appropriate because there's a flag of Spain hanging in the foreground of that picture. In the top right corner, I wanted to remind people about what New Orleans was like in this era. In the 1850s, Exchange Alley was, uh, had a lot of um, slave pens uh, where enslaved people were sold from. And often the, um, the, the merchants, the, the slave uh, holders would display uh, the men and women in front in tuxedos and dresses as, uh, as, uh, because they were, they were being sold. And uh, this, um, this is actually a, uh, a depiction of, uh, of slaves being, um, enslaved people being sold at Exchange Alley. So just to give context so we can remember what, what area, what era we're dealing with. So uh, again, between 3 and 4 p.m., Consul Laborde arrives at the mayor's office to discuss the issue of the day. Uh, the, it's, by now, it's too late to reason with La Union. Um, you know, news, even in the city, it's passing slowly. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to do uh, simultaneous things at once, but they just can't do it fast enough. Um, at some point between 3 and 4, the letters from the American prisoners actually um, entrusted with Mr. Brinci were finally deposited to the city's post office, which is on Canal Street. Uh, but again, the uh, the riot, as it's being called now, is um is fully underway. Uh, so at four thirty, um, tensions erupt on the uptown side of Canal Street with a knife slashing and brick throwing at the same shop where tensions erupted earlier at the corner of St. Charles and Gravier. Uh, the store will be ransacked, and this would repeat itself all night at several stores and shops uh, throughout the city. They were damaged and destroyed, shops that were owned by Spaniards. Um, it, it was really targeted when, when you think about it. It was, it, you could tell that the tension had been building up for a while. It wasn't a one day thing. Um, this is something that had been building up because the, the, the attacks were, were very coordinated. Um, this one slashing though seemed to be the only bloodshed of the, of the day. Uh, um, I can't find evidence that there was another um, that there was anything other, more violent than this, other than the actual looting and, and rioting. Um, there wasn't too much um, uh, uh, person-to-person violence from what I can tell. Uh, the images that I've got here 
are of the map. Again, uh, we're looking at um, uh, this area would be number seven on the map, right on, on St. Charles, um, Gravier in, in St. Charles. Uh, back in the 1850s, we would have seen this grand hotel, the St. Charles Hotel would have been at the corner. The reason I like displaying these images at the, at the top is, the, uh, is, a, is an actual photograph. And at the bottom is a lithograph that's based on that photograph. And they're both made available to me from the historic New Orleans collection. The reason why I like showing this is because you can clearly see uh, the building to the right um, has, uh, has some businesses next to it. One's a hatter, the other one is a, a, a cigar shop. This is Havana Cigars. I don't know if this is the one that was, a, if this is the shop that was attacked, but we do know from looking at maps and doing research that this area was, had a heavy concentration of, 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 a, cube, of, of, of a cigar shops owned by Spaniards. Um, uh, and on the right hand side, we see uh, Plaza St. Charles, which is the current um, building that occupies that same, uh, uh, that, that same footprint of the St. Charles Hotel. The Spanish Council, which again uh, is it, was at the corner of Bourbon and uh, St. Louis, was attacked between five and six p.m. Uh, the consulate sign was torn off uh, and then burned in Lafayette Square uh, during a previously arranged public meeting later that night. Uh, another attack on the on the Spanish uh, cigar store, St. Charles Avenue, would occur again. Well, it's actually at a different store, not the one on St. Charles and Gravier, but rather one on uh, St. Charles further up. Uh, the crowd returned to the Spanish consulate after the police went to other sites of disorder. They broke furniture. They tore apart the painting of the, of the Queen of Spain and tore the Spanish flag into pieces. Uh, the, the consul's documents and archives were thrown into the streets. Uh, there were ads in the newspaper for weeks asking people to return any papers that, that may have been recovered or, uh, or stolen during the riot. Uh, around this time, an unruly crowd gathered at Chapatulas in Poitras and Mayor Crossman was able to address them and get them to disperse. Uh, again, it, it was a pretty violent night. Uh, I'm rather shocked there wasn't more bloodshed, but um, you know, I, I think people were aware that this was an international incident when it was occurring. So let's talk a little bit about the aftermath of the Lopez riot. And as we can see uh, throughout all these sites, you know, all these pin sites are relevant in this map. Uh, several businesses owned by Spaniards were attacked. The Spanish consulate was ransacked and looted. Same for the office of La Union. Uh, the Spanish consul had to leave the city and left without, uh, it would not return for several weeks. Um, the, uh, the, the, the editors of, uh, of the paper never returned, as I said. Um, this caused an international incident between the US and Spain that had um, the, the president of the United States himself and the secretary of state dealing directly with this as an act of diplomacy. Um, and the United States actually repaid a reparation to the Spaniards who had lost property in, uh, a couple years later in 1853. The amount back then was $25,000. From what I've been able to um, understand, that's about $1 million today. Um, and also tensions persisted, they didn't end. Uh, Spaniards, Cubans, and Lopez supporters would go on um, with, their, with their problems with each other for, for a couple more years. And this was actually one of the results of, of that uh, tension. A month after the riot, we see the emergence, uh, the establishment of a brand new newspaper called El Pelayo, which was um, established by a man named uh, Eduardo, Eduardo San Just. Um, and it was uh, really established as a direct response to what happened during the Lopez riot and to give Spaniards a voice. Um, we'll see that it's, it's manifest, it's a, Mastez says it's a periódico político, literario y mercantil organo de la población española de Nueva Orleans, right? Um, and uh, they would continue the aggressive um, tradition that La Patria and La Union had held as Spanish language voices of dissent in the city. Um, if I, shouldn't, I should mention that if I, if I didn't earlier that uh, New Orleans was actually the first city in the United States with a Spanish language newspaper way back in 1808, a publication named uh, El Mississippi. And uh, there's been um, you know, a consistent presence of, of Spanish language press in the metro area ever since. It's not, it's not every year. There's been years where we haven't had any, and there's been some lulls, but it's, it's been pretty consistent, even though the Spanish-speaking population of the city is pretty small. And this uh, newspaper was uh, located here, as I show. It's number, uh, it's number, let's see, number eight on our, uh, no, 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 it's number 13 on our map. It's at the corner of uh, Charters in Toulouse. That's where the, uh, the newspaper was published. 
here in December 14th, we've got an update on the uh, on the uh, on the political drama that happened, the international drama uh, uh, that took place after the Lopez riot. You'll see that this um, story from that date is entitled Sobre el Motín de New Orleans, which means the, about the riot in New Orleans or on the riot in New Orleans. And notice this is four months after after the uh, after the uh, the event, but we're still getting news because it is an international incident and news travels slow. But it's it's relevant. It's it's in the zeitgeist. People are. It's something that's that's um that's important, right? And in this uh, issue, we see that there's a list of of victims, people who had their property damaged, and we see the first one is the consulate, the consulado, right? The consulate of Her Majesty, the Queen of Spain. Uh, then we go the the printing press in the office of uh, the newspaper La Union, and then these different cafes um, uh, and, and businesses. There's two that are underlined that I uh, that I want to um, uh, uh, highlight. One is uh, this one is uh, for a store for a man named Don Antonio Hernandez, which was completely destroyed. Uh, the one below it as well is um, it says that there's other stores and other victims who aren't being enumerated, aren't being named in this list, right? And so there's something that I want to uh, show you when it comes to this. So with El Pelayo. So there were advertisements in El Pelayo from these victims, right? And one of them we see is from Antonio Hernandez. And, you know, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm basically saying, you know, this, uh, his store, he actually um, uh, uh, rented out a new space. He had been in, in another part of town, but now he's on Royal Street. I believe this is like the third or four or 400 block of Royal Street. Uh, and he's announcing to his friends that, um, that, uh, that he's back in, in business, but at a different location due to the riot, right? So we know that Antonio Hernandez was actually named in the list in El Pelayo. Um, this other advertisement is from a man named Jay Fernandez. And he's also announcing that he has um, reestablished his cigar shop. And this one, if you look at the under, at the blue underline, it's at the corner of St. Charles and Gravier. So I'm assuming that this is the same store that he's the owner, and he his his employee Gonzalez was the man who was slashed, um, or did the slashing, um, and that after he uh, he fixed um, the damages, he's reopening it. So he's announcing it. Here we have two announcements, right? And so this is where I'm going. To, we're we're gonna. Um, we're really going to leave the Lopez riot where it is. We saw that, you know, it was a, it's a, it's an incredible event. Um, but these advertisements allow us to see more windows into the Spanish speaking residents of the city. Right. And so we're going to move into that because we see the aftermath. We, we see the importance of the Lopez riot, but these newspapers that this newspaper does reveal other things about, about the wider audience um, uh, of Spanish speaking readers who aren't Spaniards. So here we have an advertisement for a hotel called Contai Veranda. And it's located on Charters, on Contai Street in between Charters and Vale Levy. And that today is Decatur. Um, Levy Street is now Decatur. And you see I have a blue line on this old map to give you an idea of, of where it is, right? Uh, it also sell, offers comida a la francesa, which means buffet style. So they, off, they obviously offered food to those people who were staying. Um, and this last sentence is really interesting to me, where it says, se recomiende particularmente a los, Espan a los españoles y mexicanos. Se habla inglés, francés y español. So they're saying this hotel is highly recommended to Spaniards and Mexicans. Notice they didn't say Cubans. Um, uh, uh, but this is important. Another thing that I should say, at this time, a hotel is not only a hotel in the way that we think about it, but it's also a boarding house. Right, so a lot of these places that are advertising them, uh, advertising themselves as hotels are hotels, but they're also boarding houses, right? Where um, where people can actually live, and it seems like like there were people that would actually live in these boarding houses as opposed to um, normal housing, right? Today we see the this is the current site of the hotel Contact Veranda. Uh, it's the site of the historic New Orleans Collections uh, Women Research Center, right? But I wanted to see if we could find evidence that Mexicans had indeed stayed in this hotel. And, and there is, there's actually, there's these two prominent Mexican gentlemen, one named Jose Mata and the other named Melchor Campo, who we can prove stayed at this hotel. Uh, uh, here's a letter from Mata to Ocampo in, in January of 1855. So, okay, this advertisement may be from 1851, but the hotel, the hotel is still around. 
And we know that, that these two Mexican gentlemen lived there because he said, si por look to the underlying part where he says, por, si por casualidad no me encuentra en el hotel Conta Veranda y donde ahora estoy, dijera donde sea Mr. Bruguera me hallará. So he's saying, if you can't find me at the hotel Veranda, uh, try to find Mr. Bru Bruguera and he's going to find me. Uh, so, so here we see evidence of that. Now, the thing about Jose Mata and Metro Campo is that they were not in New Orleans alone. In fact, they were part of an exile community which had been thrown out of Mexico by General Santa Ana um, in the crazy uh, years after um, the Mexican-American War where Mexico was going through a lot of stability. And so we have gentlemen like uh, Ponciano Ajayaga, Guillermo Prieto, Ignacio Comenfort, Juan Batista, Juan Batista Ceballos. All these men are politicians who are living in New Orleans in exile. And while they're in New Orleans, they're developing what's called the Plan of Ayutla, which was uh, basically um, an armed rebelling against Santana's government. And to make a long story short, it succeeded, right? But, um, but a lot of that plan was, was planned, a lot of fundraising, uh, and a lot of the logistics for it were done in New Orleans in between 1852 and 1855. Now, there's one person I haven't mentioned from this, uh, uh, from this group, who I think is really important, and, and, I'll, and I'll show you why. So another member of this exile group was Benito Juarez himself, who was president of Mexico. He's the first indigenous president of Mexico, and he served from 1858 through 1872. We can see that not long after leaving New Orleans in 1855, he would go on to become president of, a, of, a, of, the, uh, of, of the country of Mexico. And we have a statue honoring him uh, at the corner of Basin and Contai, uh, which is just about seven blocks away from the, uh, from the former side of the, of the Contai Hotel that he stayed in, because there is evidence that he stayed at that hotel as well. Um, and so, uh, and, and uh, when this statue was dedicated in 1965, it was done with the full understanding that Benito Juarez had lived here in exile with, um, with a group of, um, of, of other Mexican political exiles. Um, What's cool about it is that Mexicans understand this history as well. They've actually commemorated artwork uh, to honor this. On the left-hand side, we've got a wood carving of Benito Juarez um, uh, working in a tobacco shop, which we know he did. On the right-hand side, we've got a diorama, which is an, uh, an art display made up of models uh, where uh, he is, um, uh, it, it's a tobacco shop where he's um, you know, doing the same thing he's doing in the wood carving. Um, and, uh, and because that's what he did, he, he worked at a, at a tobacco shop, lived a precarious life. He caught yellow fever twice. I recently found out that if you survive yellow fever the, uh, once that you basically have lifetime immunity. Um, and, so, um, and so, yeah, it's important to remember that Benito Juarez actually lived in New Orleans for a little while. And while he was here, he actually became friends with Pedro Santa Cilia, the Cuban refugee and political activists who advocated for the freedom of Cuba. These two became very close. We know that their conversations involved the political developments in the Americas, just as, just as Cuba was struggling for liberation, Mexico and Mexico was struggling for stability. Santa Cita supported the Ayula movement through money and arms. He was the last to see Juarez leave New Orleans for Mexico. He escorted him to, to the steamboat that took him to Veracruz. Uh, and Juarez would become president of Mexico uh, in, the 18, in the 1858 and by the late 1860s, uh, Santa Cita would join him there and work for his administration. Eventually, Santa Cita married Juarez's eldest daughter, right? And then there's at least, uh, at least one historian that I'm aware of who suggests that Juarez's friendship with Santa Cilia helped Benito Juarez understand that Mexico stability was not only important for Mexicans, but it was actually important for the entire hemisphere uh, and, its, and its fledgling republics. So again, this is something that that I want, to, I want us to understand um, because this isn't the last time that we would see prominent Latin American exiles uh, land in New Orleans in order to foment um, uh, a revolution. Uh, in fact, um, we know that at, towards the end of the 19th century, there were two major wars between Cuba and Spain. The first was the 10 years war in 1868 to 1878. And then the second one was the war of independence between 1895 and 1898, right? After, once the 10 years war commenced, there were tensions that erupted once again in New Orleans. It didn't lead to a riot like in 1851, but I did find these newspaper stories. This first one here in the middle 
is about um, a pro-Cuban demonstration. So there were a group, a group of people who, um, of Cubans who supported independence for Cuba who marched down Poitras with a large Cuban flag chanting um, a chants like Cuba Libre and, and things like that, right? Um, the, the other story is of a duel between a supporter of the Cuban revolutionaries and a Spaniard who lived in New Orleans named Pepe Yuya, who um, was a very colorful character. Unfortunately, that's a story for another day. But um, they, the, the, the supporter, the, the, the Cuban supporter challenged Pepe Yuya to a duel. And Pepe Yuya was a famous duelist. He was uh, known for a lot of things, but he was famous for being a duelist, whether um, by sword or by gun. And he won this duel. They had to go to Jefferson Parish because by, now, by this time, duels were illegal in New Orleans. But he won this duel. Um, and so that was in 1869. Now, um, between uh, the war is, the 10 years war is, open, is over in 1878, and then the other war starts in 1895. But between then, we have a movement of Cuban, uh, of the of Cuban diaspora, members of the Cuban diaspora all over the Atlantic world, in the United States and in Central America, Mexico, and other parts of the Caribbean, who are organizing uh, in order to get more support for another uh, uprising against the Spanish, right? And two of those men were Antonio Maceo, the Bronze Titan, and Maximo Gomez, who had was actually a Dominican-born Cuban soldier. Uh, Dr. Rebecca J. Scott, uh, in, in 2004, I believe, maybe 2008, published her uh, book, Degrees of Freedom, uh, where she, I would say, rediscovered for the for American uh, the for American researchers and American readers. She rediscovered that Maceo and Gomez had been in New Orleans between, for nine months, almost a year, between 1884 and 1885. Um, this is something that's known in Cuba, from what I understand, but you know, it's not something that, from what I saw, wasn't really talked about until Dr. Scott really resurrected this, this fact. When I, I, and so I have a copy of a, a picture of her book up at the top, and uh, I highlighted the excerpt from her book that talks about how they had um, rented a house at 227 St. Philip. In Germain, and then I actually looked for um, for primary source uh, evidence to back that up, and I actually found uh, Maximo Gomez's diary in the archives of the Dominican Republic, where we can see that 227 Saint Philip, New Orleans, was indeed the place where they lived while they were here. Now, I want to make sure we understand that Antonio Maceo. If you're not familiar with Cuban history, Antonio Maceo and Maximo Gomez are giants of Cuban history and indeed of Latin American history, and I would say the entire the history of the entire hemisphere. We can see that they're on Cuban currency, right? Um, uh, Maceo would die during the revolution of uh, 1895 during the Spanish-American War. Well, the Cuban Revolution, which was then usurped by the United States and turned into the Spanish-American War. And Maximo Gomez would actually um, go on to, I think, serve as president of Cuba um, under the American Constitution. I could be wrong. Maybe it was a high office, um, maybe president, but I forget. But they were so well known that when they arrived in New Orleans, the Daily Picayune sent a reporter to go talk to them. You know, and uh, that's why we have this uh, this story, Distinguished Arrivals. Um, and not to get too much into it, it's clear from, how, now that we know the history of it, that when that reporter was sent to them, Gomez and Maceo were intent on not really revealing much about their plans. And so they gave very vague answers. Um, another thing that I discovered is that when Antonio Maceo got to New Orleans, you know, they stayed at a hotel for a couple of weeks down there on Camp Street, close to Lee Circle. And uh, unfortunately, when he got to New Orleans, he lost his dog Delia, and he took out an advertisement in, uh, in the newspaper to try to find it, but I couldn't find evidence that, they that his dog was found. So I wanna get back to this letter um, and, and, uh, that, that shows us where they lived, because I think, it's, um, I think this is one of the, an important thing is, is really grounding these things, th these histories in our city and in our urban landscape. And so I, I looked through, uh, I went on a journey to look through the maps to try to find this place, because one thing you have to know as a historian of the city is that before 1895, New Orleans used a completely different address system. And so if, if you find an address from the 1880s, you have to go through different maps to triangulate the actual location because it, it's, it's done completely differently now. And so 227 St. Philip Street would actually start in the French Quarter, but the, those streets in the French Quarter that started at the river actually started, I think, at the 300 or 400 block. So 227 St. Philip doesn't even exist today. But what I did find is by looking at the, um, at the Sanborn fire insurance maps from the 1880s and 1890s, is that 227 St. Philip was precisely at the corner of St. Philip and Robertson. 
North Robertson, just a block away from the from Claiborne, right? At the time that Masao Gomez would have been there, there would have been no bridge. But if we go to this picture on the right, X marks the spot, I've located it. I can tell you with 100% certainty that the site where Maceo and Gomez once lived uh, while they were on their, uh, you know, on their, uh, uh, their venture, their journey to try to reorganize the um, uh, 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 uprising against Spain in Cuba, they lived at, at this place, which is now 16, uh, basically the address is 1601 St. Philip. It's a driveway that belongs to a lodge hall, the, um, the hall of, of, uh, of the Society of Inseparable Friends. It all seems to be on the campus of the Charbonnet Labatt funeral home. And the driveway itself is right across the street from Tubafat Square, which I know is, um, we all know is a pretty significant site in Treme and also for, um, for, uh, for uh, uh, our um, Mardi Gras Indians um, on Mardi Gras Day. Um, and so with that, uh, I just wanna, um, you know, really close to wrapping up, I do wanna establish um, a perspective for why the Lopez riot is, is a significant and relevant historical event. And what I would say is that when we look at the Lopez riot and its aftermath and what it shows us, it shows us that there are several things that are important to the hemis to the history of the Americas that are themselves that are, are actually manifesting themselves in the city, right? And one of them is that the United States as an empire is ascending. We're at, at the early stages of manifest destiny. Uh, where the country's expanding out west, it's expanding uh, with war through Mexico, and it's you know a toying with the idea of expanding into the Caribbean. We see that Spain is declining. Its stranglehold on Cuba and Puerto Rico, its last two colonies in the Americas, is 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 losing its grip, and it would do things in future decades you know, like uh, emancipating enslaved people and granting more rights to um to the people of Cuba in order to maintain that empire, but ultimately. Uh, the United States would succeed in pushing Spain out of the Americas um, by 1898. We see that Cuba is struggling for liberation against Spain, that there's proponents of its liberation in the city of New Orleans, both people who, who are militant and also those who are, who are taking more of a political route. And we also see that Mexico is struggling for stability during this era, and that there's political exiles from Mexico in New Orleans who actively are planning uh, a, a political uprising in order to overthrow the government. So these things are all going on. Um, they're going on around the hemisphere, but they're also manifesting themselves in New Orleans. But before I finish, I have one more, one more, um, I have one more uh, slide that I want to show you. Something that's a little tongue in cheek, but I want to leave us on a, on a, on more of a, 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 a good note and something that I find funny. Right, and I will explain to you why. So it's a letter from Jose Mata to Melchor Campo in Valentine's Day of 1855. And Mata, after having left the Kantai Hotel to a um, to a hostel, or I should say, a um, a boarding house in uh, on Annunciation Street in the warehouse district, uh, he writes to uh, Ocampo saying this: "The hace nueve días el hotel de Conti." Y me tiene ahora quite Yankee en el barrio americana con una familia americana en donde no habla más que inglés. So here's this Mexican writing to another Mexican in 1855 about having to leave the French Quarter in order to go uptown in the warehouse district to another uh, boarding house. And he said that that move across town has got him feeling quite Yankee. And I think when we when we understand what New Orleans was and the transformation that New Orleans was going through in the 19th century. Uh, and what it meant to be New, what, what it meant to be New Orleans, whether it was this uh, this French Francophone Creole city or this emerging uh, uh, U.S. American city, you know, I think this um, this core right here sort of captures that. Um, and with that being said, uh, this is the end. I thank you very, very, very much for this, and I welcome all of your questions. Thank you very much for uh, for this. Thank you so much. Um... Raphael, that was really, really interesting. And uh, I mean, yeah, uh, we're gonna have to go. We're looking forward to deeper dives into this subject because it really is fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, if people do have questions, um, uh, please put them in the chat or in a second, I'll let anybody that wants to say it, they can. The first thing I'm gonna bring up was when you talked about the riot uh, beginning and the newspaper articles. 
that came out. You said that basically within two hours, they went from a newspaper article to people were in out in the streets and uh, protesting. Uh, that almost seems like social media is, is slow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty impressive that that could happen in yeah. such a quick amount of time at that time in, in, in the world. I think it's demonstrative of the fact that the tensions have been building up for a very long time. Okay. And it tells me that, you know, a lot of the tension for, for that day was built around the fact that um, this co deputy consul was supposed to leave mail from these captured Americans at the post office and he never did it, um, or at least he, he, he delayed it. And so I think that it's, it's reflective of, which means it, it tells me another thing. People knew that that mail was coming, right? Okay, yeah, and that's, that, that plays some part of it. Right. Absolutely. And even yeah. though it takes four days to travel between Havana and New Orleans, what we have to understand is that there were ships coming in, arriving and leaving between those two ports every single day. And so there were people coming in every day. So, so although uh, uh, Deputy Consul Brincio doesn't get there till the 21st, there was probably a ship from Cuba that arrived on the 20th that let him know he was coming. Yeah. So, so yeah. And I mean, again, that's why it's important to really understand just the small space, the French Quarter and the, and the Central Business District. We know today that that's not a big area. And if you really want to get to one from one to another, you can relatively quickly. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, Yvette Rubio says, for those New Orleanians who were descended from the original Spanish colonists, which side did they take in the issue, Spain or Cuba? Um, and were, there, uh, were they, the descendants of the original Spanish colonists, considered Spanish by the pro-Cuban independence population? Or was this tension purely between recent Spanish immigrants and recent Cuban immigrants? So it's definitely the latter. From what we understand, the, the, the descendants of the Spanish colonists that came, which there were few. Remember that New Orleans was always a, a primarily Francophone place during the colonial era. Um, from what we know, these colonists basically were absorbed into the French Creole um, community. And so by the 1850s, they, I doubt that they would have had an attachment to Spain in that way. Um, so yeah, this beef would have really been going on between, um, between you know, people who had recently more or less uh, moved to New Orleans from either Spain or Cuba. And remember that there were a lot of Spaniards who had actually lived in Cuba before they moved to New Orleans. And the reason that they were in New Orleans is because they were facilitating business between the two places. Um, Salvador says, awesome lecture. Uh, Getty says, great presentation. Laura, very interesting. Emily Perkins, who's at the Historic New Orleans College, says, thank you so much for mapping all this out. So much taking place right around the buildings of the HNSC. I'd love to see an interactive map view of this important historical event. Well done. Yeah, that would be, um, uh, so that would be a very interesting uh, thing to see. And then uh, Salvador says, I'll never understand why New Orleans is not seen as a Spanish city, just French. Yeah, well. <laughs> Well, you know, and that's an interesting thing. I think that for me, you know, when we when New Orleans is referred to as a Creole city, I think that it's it's respective of both the French and the Spanish, although leaning way more heavily towards the French. Um, we we do I think we do under um, we do undersell just how important the, the Spanish era was here, but we also should also we shouldn't forget that Spanish was never the the language of the day in New Orleans. It was really the language of, of, of military and government when the Spanish were here during the colonial era. But that even after the fires, from you know from talking to historians that know more about this than I do, my understanding is that the vast majority of the engineers were were francophone Creoles from either Louisiana or even the French Caribbean who were involved in this. So. Again, new, you know, when we have to think of New Orleans as this mixture, right, um, of French, Spanish, African, and United States. Um, that's the only way we really, and that's why I argue that we have to view New Orleans from a hemispheric perspective instead of trying to struggle with it as a city in the United States. We have to understand that it's a city of the Americas. Yeah. Uh, Raphael, I want to thank you so much. That was a fantastic lecture. Uh, we'll be talking soon about some other stuff that you're working on. I wish you best of luck with the dissertation and uh, thank you so much for doing it tonight. And thank you for everyone for attending tonight. And we will see everybody uh, have a great Mardi Gras and we will see everybody in a couple weeks uh, as we return to Tuesday nights again. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you.